welcome everyone all out across America. And we're delighted that you're with us. I think Simone left out one of our big groups, which is uh, Edgewater High School parents uh, up in Orlando. They're having a parent peer group of, of 12 parents. And of course, for informed families, that's always what we're trying to drive home is creation of parent peer groups so that you could start to have your own set of norms and that you actually know what they are. And so we're really delighted to have Rick Howell with us, who is the Deputy Director at the Florida Center for Prevention Research at Florida State University. And Rick has really, uh, he served as the principal investigator and co-principal investigator on eight different state and federal grants involving um, the social norms model and how you use that, how you implement that to reduce um, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, and sexual violence. And that's been going on at FSU and 38 rural high schools and 21 middle schools around the state. So Rick, we are definitely delighted that you're here. David Vittoria is at MSW and he is the head of the South Miami um, Substance Abuse Treatment Center, which is part of Baptist Health of South Florida. And he is on Informed Families Board of Directors. He does our from the front line. He tells us all the things that are going on out there that sometimes we don't know about. Uh, he's a Miami, Miami native, and he uh, is a master's in social work, graduating twice from FS, from FIU. FIU. At, as summa cum laude. So David must be smart. So this is a good thing, David. We're really glad you're with us. Uh, and he also sports, serves on the board at MAD. So MAD's done a really good job at changing social norms, I think. Um, and with that said, I think, Rick, because we don't want to take any more time away from your presentation about the social norms model. I'll be following this uh, presentation outline today. I'll give you a, a brief overview of what social norms marketing is about. Uh, talk to you about the three process steps uh, you use to implement a norms campaign. Take a look at some of the uh, past survey data outcomes from uh, previous surveys. And then a look at the uh, social norms media and I'll, I'll take your, your questions. So just a, a bit about uh, what we do. I am with the, uh, the Florida Center for Prevention Research at FSU, uh, the Deputy Director, and we're under the Institute of Science and Public Affairs. Uh, the graph below basically shows that we've got quite a bit of experience in implementing the norms model primarily as a uh, strategy to reduce uh, alcohol abuse. Uh, at the college, uh, middle school, and high school levels. And we've also adapted the model as a uh, tool to uh, prevent sexual violence. We've got a program here at FSU, and we're also in 11 middle schools uh, trying to reduce uh, teen dating and relationship violence. So we've been doing this for a long time, for 13 years at FSU. We've learned uh, along the way, and I would say that uh, by and large, we have had uh, much success with the, the project. So what is social norms marketing? Uh, I've given you a brief definition at the top. Uh, basically, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a media campaign targeting a particular audience, whether it's middle school students, high school students, college students, to promote that target population's true, accurate, and healthy norms with respect to alcohol use. Uh, the theory's been around since the mid-80s. It was designed uh, or developed by a couple of researchers from the Hobart and William Smith College, and they had developed it as an intervention to reduce uh, high risk drinking at the, at the college campus. Uh, and so basically their, their theory was, uh, based on their research, that the majority of students that they surveyed overestimated the amount of alcohol used. Sorry by their peers, and as a result of that overestimation of alcohol use, they were more inclined to uh, participate in uh, that particular negative behavior. And so we find the same dynamic uh, going on at the middle school and high school level that students overestimate the amount of alcohol use or ATOD use, and that can be unhealthy. 
So what we do is we de design media to promote the true, accurate norm, and we expect to see uh, an increase in healthy behavior and a reduction in uh, uh, closing the gap with respect to uh, the norms regarding alcohol use. I've got a, a bullet there that says it's not the uh, silver bullet. And, and basically what I mean by that is uh, typically, you know, at FSU we have multiple programs that are out there to address uh, alcohol abuse on campus. Social norms marketing is one of those and we've seen some very impressive re, uh, results at uh, accurately uh, correcting the norm. Uh, at the high school and middle school level, typically we uh, are joined up with other agencies to uh, promote other uh, programs. So we may use uh, an NREP program uh, too good for drugs. We may also couple that with uh, a parental program guiding good choices to to help out uh, with that. And so uh, it's not basically designed to be to stand alone, but it works great as a, a component with other programs. Basically what we're trying to do is uh, achieve these particular goals when using this approach as an alcohol reduction strategy. You know, we talked about the first one, we're trying to increase accurate perceptions among students, but we're also looking to improve accurate perceptions among school staff and parents who also misperceive the norm, who also think there's a whole lot more alcohol use going on that's, than is actually occurring. And, and what we hope to see is an increase in positive, healthy behavior, such as non-use of alcohol when we're looking at uh, middle school and high school targets. And, and predominantly what we're trying to do is reinforce what students are doing right. We're trying to shift the focus away exclusively from focusing on the negative, you know, the minority of students who uh, use alcohol who unfortunately uh, may have some problems associated with that. I mean, that's, we're not saying take that off the table. What we're talking about, if you're an educator, you have a norms campaign going on in your school, you may want to, to pat the students on the back and say, you know, I'm proud of you. The majority of you are not using alcohol and uh, that's a good thing. I get the, uh, you know, periodically, what's the difference between social marketing and social norms marketing? If you're in Florida, you may have seen uh, the Be The Law campaign, which is the graphic under social marketing. And it's a technique that, that uses uh, marketing techniques to uh, basically convey, try to change behavioral goals for social good. So in this particular case, they're talking about they want parents to be the wall between uh, their kids and alcohol, and they've got a, a media campaign to do that. What we're trying to do is use those same social marketing techniques, but what we're trying to do is change misperceptions of the norm. So that's really the distinction if you, if you're have heard that before. So whether you're, you're putting together a campaign to uh, reduce sexual violence uh, or reduce alcohol abuse, you're going to follow these three process steps. You're going to collect and analyze data. This is a data-driven process. Uh, typically when we're in a, a middle school or high school, we do a census survey. And that means that if you're at school, the day that the survey is administered, you take it unless uh, you opt out because it's voluntary or you're absent. So from a research standpoint, it's about as good as you get. I mean, you've got basically representation from the entire entire target audience. And so the uh, there's very minimal uh, error with respect to the data. And then we take that, we analyze the media, we try to develop messages that highlight the positive norm. And we do that as pervasively as we can with our, our budget. We typically run the campaign uh, in high school, middle school. We use the Teen Norms Middle School Survey, which has been normed and validated against that particular target. We run the campaign for about uh, nine months. Typically, it will cross school year, so you leave off in June, you pick up in August, and then we repeat the process uh, depending how long uh, the, the grant goes for, multiple years. This is a, an excerpt from the Teen Norms uh, Middle School Survey. And here we're looking at 
uh, 30 day prevalence use. I know it's probably kind of hard to read, but uh, one of the questions would read during the past 30 days on how many days did you uh, do the following? You know, have at least one drink of alcohol. So that's the individual self reported norm. Later in the survey, we'll have a companion question that looks at uh, during the past 30 days on how many days do you think a typical student at your school had at least one drink of alcohol. So that's obviously the perceived norm, and we have a battery of questions, companion questions like this, looking at behavioral norms. Uh, what do you typically drink when you go out with, uh, hang out with your friends? We look at attitudinal norms, injunctive norms. Do you think it's okay for uh, pressure uh, students to drink alcohol? Do you think it's okay for middle school students to drink alcohol? Do you think it's okay for parents to provide alcohol to middle school students. So we've got, again, a variety of questions in there that look at what the self-reported norm is and what the perceived norm is. Here's an example of, of what we typically find. And I know we have middle school uh, representatives out there, high school representatives, uh, probably folks from college level. When we look at disparities between the actual norm and perceived norm, this is very typical. So this is a response uh, to that particular question from uh, one of the battery of surveys that we did for one of the cohort uh, groups. In this case, 11% of students said that they had had at least one drink of alcohol in the past 30 days. They perceived that number to be 52%. So what we do is promote through media that the majority of students, 9 out of 10, have not used alcohol in the past 30 days. Again, we're trying to reinforce that positive norm. So if you are in the clear majority that do not drink, this will help with respect to not feeling pressure that you have to participate in order to fit in. You're in the majority, so we're hoping to cut down on that uh, with these uh, particular messages. And this is just to look at a, a combined sample uh, over uh, three years where we conducted uh, a survey at T1, which is baseline. You fast forward to T3, that's the uh, third uh, iteration of the survey, and you can see where we have had an impact on correcting, uh, you know, improving behavior with the self-reported norms, but also improving perceived norms. And, you know, when you're in social norms marking, that is really what we are trying to impact when we're able to close that gap with, uh, between the actual and perceived norms, we will see an increase in uh, accurate in more uh, healthy behaviors with respect to the norm. So again, this may be a little hard to see, but this is pretty representative of the campaigns that we have initiated. I like to say this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. In order to achieve results, with this particular uh, model, it needs to be as long term as you can make it. Uh, having a program for one year really probably will not pay large dividends. This one uh, went for three years and uh, uh, we had some good results and we have had other, you know, very good results here at FSU. We've been doing it for 13 years. Are parents important? Absolutely. I mean, this slide, I think, says a lot. This is another question from the Teen Norm Survey. It asks students to rank uh, sources of believability about alcohol information from uh, somewhat believable to very believable. And in this particular case, parents are number one at T1 at baseline and T2, above police, health professionals, teachers, and counselors. So if you're a parent, you know, if you're a, if you're a teacher in the school, students listen to you or your kids listen to you. They may not always appear to do so, but you know, this represents that parents play a very active role in what their kids think and what their kids do with respect to purveying information, accurate information about alcohol use. And we do the process step three, conduct a targeted media campaign. This is just an example of a campaign we've done, uh, used in the past at the, uh, the middle school level. Uh, because we're in a middle school, as opposed to being at FSU, this is a pretty good media mix. Uh, Eleven post or eight posters uh, over a nine-month period. Uh, three banners, eight by three-foot banners. These 
vinyl floor graphics that go down in high traffic areas. If you're a student, you're going to see these repetitively because we've got pretty much of a captive audience. And what we find is in order to make a cognitive difference for them to understand, interpret, uh, and relay this, it's, uh, you know, it takes about eight, eight views of the message to have an impact. So we also monitor that with our survey data to see if we've got the right mix, uh, if it's working. At the, at the college level, it's a different story. These guys are inundated daily with media, and so it takes a, a more concerted effort, costs a lot more money in order to achieve the desired outcome. Thank you, Rick. That was really very informative, and we're so glad that you do that research. And I guess, you know, as I've said to everyone, Informed Families Forte, I think, is taking research and getting it out to real people and getting them to do something with it. And so we'll talk about that some more. But David, of course, being on the front line in the treatment area, David, what jumped out at you on, on this presentation? That yeah, a couple things. Thank you, Peggy. And thank you, Rick. Uh, thank you for the phenomenal work you're doing. And Peggy, I think you hit it on the head. You know, it's this is fantastic information. This is a lot for us to take in. What do we do with that information? So a couple things really stood out to me. You know, Rick mentioning the importance of being strengths-based. Talking about it from the treatment perspective and the adolescents, the young adults that come into our program, for that matter, the adults that come into our program. It's really important for us to first highlight uh, what that person's doing well. So uh, not just focus on what the problems are, the drinking, the marijuana usage, whatever that may be. That's important. We have to cover that as a treatment center. But, you know, what things are you doing well? So we can look for ways to replicate those strengths and those talents. So that Rick mentioned the importance of being strengths-based, I, I think is key. You know, um, here, here's something else that stood out. Being positive, using positive reinforcement. You know, it's very easy, and I tell parents this all the time. It's easy, it's understandable that you're upset, that you're fearful, and those are valid feelings and we can talk about those things. It's also very important to use positive, constructive conversation to say, you know what, I'm really upset, mm -hmm. but I'm glad that we're here doing this together. You know what, I'm really angry that you've lied, but I'm very glad that you know we have this opportunity to get you help. So that, that positive feedback and being strength-based, those are things that really, uh, that really stood out for me. Yeah. yeah, that's really that's really key. I and I think that if some of you met my grandson last um, webinar, where he's a senior at UM, and we we're talking about all the things that are going on out there in the world. What are the social norms? Well, I have to tell you, I have to watch myself because as I get all this information across my desk, the easiest thing to do is push send. You know, and then then I realize, well, I don't want to be mom all downer always you know just constantly bombarding yeah. them with information so i think that you're bringing up some really good points about how do schools how do how do parents deliver a message that can be heard yeah yeah and, and you know we know and, and, and we, we've known this in the clinical realm if, if you want a message to stick and this is this is more true for adolescents and the young adult population in, in, in the stage that their brain is developing. Uh, if you want a message to stick, it's not just repetition. If you want a message to stick, attach it to something positive. Here's why this is important to you, son. Here's why this is important to our family. Here's what good can come from this. Is that the silver bullet? Does that automatically ensure that they're not gonna drink, that they're not gonna use? No, but you're gonna get a much more favorable response and you're likely to get the outcome you're looking for, which is to keep our kids um, off of drugs and keep them from drinking if you attach that to a positive message, if you're able to help someone envision a future without any of those negative consequences. So that, that positive messaging I think is uh, really important. You know, another thing that Rick mentioned that I thought was key is, is you know, to put all this research together, you have to, you have to ask questions. Mm -hmm. You know, I found it fascinating that, uh, you know, not at all surprising, but really fascinating that uh, while a, a, a large group of young people, I think it was in the middle school study he was talking about, you know, thought that this particular behavior was going on, they thought to a much greater degree than it actually was. And, you know, uh, I talked to my daughter last night. My daughter's 18 years old. She's a senior in high school. I said, hey, listen, I'm going to be, you know, having this talk tomorrow. Here's what it's about. What can you tell me? And she had two words, impression management. She said, 
that is what life is about in high school today. And she, she was, we probably could have had her here. She did done a much better job than yeah, me at talking about her. some of this stuff. Next time we'll invite Lauren. Okay. You know, but she, she, she actually walked me through, you know, and you talk about the virtual space and, yes. and, and whatnot. She, she walked me through what it was like when it was pretty much only Facebook. And her and her friends posting where they were, what they were doing, and who they were with. And said, do people use Facebook now? Do young adults use Facebook? Of course they do. Hundreds of millions of them. But now it's Instagram. And now, more than it just being, here's who I'm with, this is where we're at, and here's what we're doing, it's just a picture. And so friends of hers, acquaintances in the school, are just putting a picture out to tell a story, right? And a lot of these youngsters are finding that there's a lot of pressure to live up to that image. So some of them are putting a picture out, posing with a bottle of alcohol. They're putting a picture out, posing with people who might be using and creating that impression out there that this is this is what it takes to be popular. But you know, she told me about how many of those acquaintances are posting those pictures with whipped cream flavored vodka and chocolate. They're not even drinking, but they have come to believe that to manage their brand, they need to put these images out. And uh, you know, that's just fascinating to me. You know, the more things kind of change the more they stay the same so do we have communication issues with our youth and is it important that parents and their kids be engaged sure but but the way kids are communicating with each other now and uh, the challenges that we as parents and concerned members of the community have you know to engage with our kids and understand all that they're having to do to manage these impressions, I think that that's a, that can I think that's a very big thing because the technology is changing so rapidly and everyone is connected to everyone else. So the social norms just, it's spreading. It's like an epidemic. Yeah. I mean, it's so quick. It's just with that push of that's a right. button. And of course, then we're always outgunned by big advertising and all the markets that they have. And when you think about the social norms they promote, and as we talked last time, it's about fun. Yeah. Now tell me who doesn't want to have fun. I mean, so I think that it's important for us to think about how we deliver our message in a way so it's not so preachy, that it's more fun, that they get to participate, and that we involve them in that. Yes. And probably one of the most successful uh, campaigns was the Truth Campaign on Tobacco. And what they did, besides doing the very things that Rick has talked about, they had a whole army of kids mm -hmm. who were part of it. Sure. So that is the question I have to all of us in this field. How do we make them part of mm -hmm. helping us deliver the message? Because that's what we need. Yeah. We need that. Well, that's such a great point. And, and you know, Rick mentioned, you know, the, the all important message of, hey, you know, kids listen to their parents and kids listen to teachers and really emphasize the need for us to keep spreading that message because our kids are listening. Well, you know, our, our kids are listening to other kids. So I think you're asking a good question, which is, you know, how do we get momentum going the other direction and get a positive message into various peer groups and schools so that they're hearing this message from their friends? You know, one of the things that we stress in, in at the Addiction Treatment Center with all populations is the importance of all of our clients getting together in a safe, sober recovery environment, not to listen to somebody like me lecture on something or give them information, but to get them together to talk about life without drinking, to talk about life without drugs, because that message amongst all of them, they know it best. They know it best. So rather than having one of us go in and preach it, much more important just to lay the groundwork and create that space for kids to share with each other. And you know, I, I also learned from my daughter because she's got a great group of friends, I'm proud to say. And, you know, she mentions that they'll end up in conversations together, three of them, four or five of them at a time, and use that opportunity just to reinforce positive messages. Oh, did you see that so-and-so posed with that? Well, I'm glad we're not doing that. So, you know, whatever we can do as adults to create that space for kids to engage in positive, healthy conversations. I think we're doing the right thing. I think so too. And I think engaging parents in those conversations <laughs> too. But here is something I've been, David and I were talking about this right before we started. Pe peers, you do listen to other parents, other peers. Sometimes your peer group is just flat wrong mm. on accurate information. Yeah. So, because they'll say things like, this is a perfect example, well, my children are totally influenced by their peer group. Yes, to a degree, but you're still more powerful. 
So we have to deliver the truthful, hmm. powerful message that sometimes goes against what yeah. we, we think. I love this little quote that someone said to me. There's what you think, hmm. there's what you know, and there's what you can prove. And there are lots of things that we can prove, like par parents are more um, influential than peers. Mm -hmm. We can prove that, but you have to believe it. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe it, then you say, oh, well, you know, there's nothing I can do. But, but then you become influential so they can hear you. Sure. Well, that's, that's a whole trick in and of itself. And when we talk about that social norm, one of the things I want to mention to you, it, just to give you a good example of something out there going on, in Florida, they've done a poll that says, you know, do you support medical marijuana? Well, 70% of people said yes, but they don't support legalization. So, you know, when you look at how people win things, they win things by perception. They win things by emotion. And so when you think about kids and drinking and alcohol and all of those things, it's all about emotion. Absolutely. So how do you how do you get that piece in there? So we've got good information, we've got the right data, right? How do we share it? How do you do the best you can to ensure it's yes. gonna stick? Yes. All right, so 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 here's how we do it on the treatment side. And it's not just the treatment side because uh, we're not just a treatment center, we act as advocates, we teach recovery and prevention. And so number one, it's about getting all the stakeholders connected to a positive message, right? So whether that's parents that are sitting in my office or coming into family group, or it's about getting, let's, let's say, parents connected to a positive message. We want to get information to parents, right? We know the kids right. are listening right. to their parents, so how do we get it to the parents? Well, we connect it to something positive. Look, here's the benefit of you having this information, real data about underage drinking, mm -hmm. the dangers of marijuana use, what synthetic drugs are, about mm -hmm. opiates, things like that. Here's the positive in you having that information. Because a lot of parents think it's obvious. Oh, well, if I just, if I know this, I'm better off and I can help my, help my, my child. You know, but giving them specific information on the incidence of use and, and misuse and abuse of some of these drugs, that's important. To then teach them how to get that message to their kids, right? And they'll often say, well, it doesn't matter, they're not listening to me anyway, right? And you know, I can't tell you how many times in the 20 years I've been doing this that I've, I've sat in an office with a, a, a teenager, a young adult, mm -hmm. and their parent, and you know, one of the parents has said, what's the point? He, he doesn't listen to anything I say. And then that child will step up and say, here are all the things that I have learned from you. And what was it always the words that the mom or dad shared? No. A lot of times, most of the time, it was the behavior they witnessed. Mom, I know you've always told me it's bad to drink, but how many times have I seen you at this function at our house? drink too much. The point there being, parents are thinking their kids aren't listening, and they are. So so how do you get both parents and kids engaged? You, you've got to attach it to something positive. You know, uh, a lot of the adolescents that we see in our program, for example, they have an extracurricular interest, okay? Mm -hmm. Could be drama, could be a sport, whatever that is. To point out to them, not just, here are the dangers of you drinking or using, but here's what you're compromising by way of your future. School is important to you. And it's not, a, it's not a threat so much as it is, look, you love baseball. Mm -hmm. So how is this going to help you pursue your baseball career? Is it going to help you at all? If not, why? And, uh, you know, attaching this important message to things like that. Here's what you have to gain, you know, from this. is important with parents and with kids, I think. It's not just about uh, kind of beating a negative message in. Don't do this, it's wrong, and here's why. It's... Here's what you have to gain. That, to me, is how you get people emotionally connected. I think you're right, and I think there must be reinforcement along the way. I So often I see people who want to deliver the one great lecture, and then it takes care of it. Even mm -hmm. It could be at, at home or at school, mm -hmm. but it isn't. It's And, you know, we've been asked repeatedly to do Red Ribbon Fridays, and mm -hmm. we really should because it reinforces the message. So if a message is really important, you can't just say it once, right? Well, uh, and yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's, a, it's like recovery, right? So the patients that come to us, it's not just about, hey, come in once, we'll tell you the dangers of drugs and they can go on your way. Right. It's come in, let's figure out what's going on, but you need to keep coming back. Keep coming back, stay surrounded by people who, who um, you know, believe in positive, healthy coping things. I mean, that's what recovery is. So, you know, keeping people in, in constant 
contact in, in a meaningful connection with this information. That's important. You can't just hammer it home once yeah. and expect it's going to stick. And that's like we're getting ready right now. Well, we're in our lock your meds phase right now. And again, delivering messages. I said, you know, I get on an elevator and people say, oh, I liked your, your um, part. So then that gives me the opportunity to say the elevator pitch, right? Just lock your meds. Um, short and sweet mm. and to the point and with a little bit of people even wanting we've been in dress stores where they want to mm. buy this and and distribute it so i think you have to think the way the market thinks in a way if you want to deliver some of these messages really effectively yeah. and that's where we're now we're getting ready it's prom and graduation mm -hmm. time and we're getting ready to move into safe home safe parties mm -hmm. so here we go with safe home safe parties and um i think we have that up on the screen mm -hmm. now and we try to get parents to take the pledge to understand what their obligations are. It's, you know, I'm telling you something that's been surprising to me. Um, I thought that when people heard that they were, could be liable and could be sued for all this, I thought behavior would change instantly. Mm -hmm. It hasn't. That's an element of it, no question. There are some people who respond to that. That's something, that's an interesting part of the social norming. Mm -hmm. Some people respond to that and others don't. That's what's yeah. been interesting to me. But um, we have all this information for you. Simone, I don't know page. if you want to go over it. Mm -hmm. um, um, what's on the slide now is our Safe Home, Safe Parties campaign, which focuses on social norms around drinking and underage drinking and marijuana and all of that. So um, uh, there are great tips to do uh, for what parents can do if their teen is having or hosting a party. So if questions you should ask, think you, things you should do, things you should pay attention to. So if you go to our homepage at informedfamilies.org, you'll be able to access all of that. And if you do take the Safe Home, Safe Parties pledge, you'll also automatically be entered to win a $50 public gift card. Uh, and the drawing is on April 30th. So do uh, support us with the Safe Home, Safe Parties campaign. We do encourage you to participate. And at least, again, go on and download the tips on what to do if your child is hosting or attending a party and, uh, and get that information. And I'd just like to build on that to say I love that message. It's a powerful message. It resonates out there. We see it working. And, you know, there's, there, there's a couple things about that message that, that really resonate with me. Number one, it stresses the importance of, for example, telling parents to know their children's friends. Know who their friends are. And I tell parents all the time, uh, you know, it, it, ask them. If you don't feel like you got all the information, go on their Facebook page. If you can't get on their Facebook page and they live in your home, tell them the only way they can continue to use the Internet in your house is if they allow you access, you know, knowing your kids' friends. And, you know, I, I, I go back to Rick and, and the, the important, fascinating research he's collected. That only comes from asking the right questions. You only, can only get this data if you ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. And we tell parents that all the time, too. Ask the question. Sometimes the most powerful moment you can create with your kids is in the question you ask, not just in the answer you think you have to have. I just wanted to add, uh, you know, I get that question a lot. How, you know, how do we get the answers we need? And, and I'll make it very simple for, for some folks. Um, you know, we've got a toll-free number for anybody that has any questions whatsoever. There is no wrong question, any question whatsoever. You know, 1-800-YES-HOPE is a great way to get a hold of us uh, answer any questions uh, about drugs. You know, we get many calls a day. And, mm -hmm. you know, I found this. What is this? How can I get this message through to my child? So there's a good number to reach out if you've got any questions at all. I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up by saying this. I was a professor at the University of Miami teaching a, a course in the Center for Addiction Studies and Education. And, and uh, I had a captive audience and I got a lot of questions about, well, you know, how do we do our part and get this message out? Uh, it starts by giving out information. So how do you get this message to students on a college campus? First, give them the accurate information. Here's what you think you know. Here's what's actually going on. You know, and second of all, here is the power that you have to do something right with this information. Here is how this can go good for you. So, you know, do you send out, uh, do you send out messages of uh, make sure you don't do this because here's something negative that could happen? You could do that, but if you attach that to a positive message and say, here is the power in this information, go do good with it, they'll listen. Great. Well, I think that wraps it up. Go out and do something good. And, uh, you know, as uh, my good friend who was um, 
uh, Tom Cash, as many of you know, who was head of the Southeast DEA, said no good deed goes unpunished. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, so when you go out to do good, don't think that everybody's going to applaud, but know we're applauding. Know you're doing the right thing. Yes. And really believe that. And then you can come back to the peer group and we'll, we'll pat you on the back and say, you're doing the right thing. Because it's a hard message to deliver. But we appreciate your help and we appreciate that you're here with us today. Yes. Thank you, David. My and thank you, Rick. Thank you so much for all that research. And I don't know what we can do without you guys. Thank, well, thank you. Thank you.